Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Most systems are built where they rely on data or behaviors from another service or third party. The problem is they don't always share the same semantics or data structures. Left unchecked, what happens is one service starts getting convoluted because it's incorporating the concepts or data structures from another service. I'll explain how you can use an anti-corruption layer as a way to translate the concepts from one boundary to another, but done in isolation. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So I often say in a lot of my videos that a service boundary is the owner of a set of business capabilities, and then the data behind that. When you're defining a service boundary, a lot of this revolves around kind of the language used in that particular domain, and you want to capture that. So the issue here is that other boundaries or external systems, how they communicate this and kind of the shared ideas that they have and the concepts might not be exactly the same within your service that you're working on. And the problem lies is when you start incorporating some of those concepts from another boundary into your own service or your own service boundary, and then it kind of muddies the water a bit. In a perfect world, our own service boundary and whatever we're integrating with some external service, we share the exact same semantics generally in similar type of data structures. So, and that can happen. And this often happens more in kind of a generic role, more in a supporting role, uh, a part of your domain that you're building. So let's say we have some external service that we're integrating with and we share the same semantics. There is really no mudding of the waters. Our service uses the exact same kind of language that we'd be using uh, an external service. An example of this may be accounting. We're leveraging some third-party accounting system because we don't want to write our own accounting uh, software. So we're leveraging that, but we do have some type of finance boundary um, that we're working in for things like receivables and payables. And all that really translate in language and concepts with our third-party accounting system. So in that case, everything's fine, it works great. Where this falls apart in a hurry is usually at the core of our domain. So I'm using the example, let's say a food delivery that I have in previous videos. And let's say we have a boundary related to ordering, to placing orders or food delivery orders. And we're also integrating with some third party system where we have to maybe reach out to them and integrate to them because they're also capturing orders um, that we need to place in our system. The problem here lies is that the semantics of how they're capturing orders and the data structure that they use and maybe the APIs that we're integrating with them, they don't really align with ours. So there has to be some type of translation that we're doing from their APIs and their data structures to how we have it within our own boundary. Now you could be tempted just to put this translation and all this behavior just within your boundary itself. But the problem is, as I mentioned, this kind of muddies the waters and convolutes what we're actually trying to do. We don't wanna take the concepts from that third party and have them directly within our boundary and kind of convoluting the whole thing. We wanna have a clear separation between that translation layer. Let our boundary be defined by the language and the behaviors that it has and the data structures that it has. And let all other services that we kind of integrate with have some separate translation that we can do with an anti-corruption layer. So what this looks like, is having something at the very edge of our service that takes that input and does that translation from the third party to what is in the core of our service in ordering. Now, again, this is something logical. It can be something physical, but the idea here is it's just something logical that lives at the edge. Now, if we have multiple different uh, services that we integrate into, and they all kind of have their own concepts, their own semantics, their own data structures, we may have different um, anti-corruption layers for each because each is gonna have to do that translation from that third-party service into our own service boundary. So to illustrate this, if you're doing something like synchronous request response over HTTP to get data from another service boundary, external service, that's what this would look like, is you're getting that data, then I'm translating that external order here to a place order. In place order, this is a command defined within my service boundary. That's how we, how we actually place an order with this, within this service boundary. Everything uses place order, everything. There's no other way to place an order within the service boundary other than calling this command. This command is sending a message to a queue which then will get processed asynchronously separately. But this is where the translation is done. We're not creating, we're not reaching out to our own database to create a record for order or do any of that stuff. 
We're simply translating some concept of an external order into our concept of place order within our service boundary. As another example, this is absolutely no different than if your incoming data is via HTTP and you need to accept to place an order. You're using the same concept of doing that translation from HTTP semantics. So it's not really necessarily a business concern, but the HTTP semantics of converting that data to an actual place order where I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm then sending that place order to a queue. So we kind of have this integration boundary where we're doing the exact same thing. If you're using a message or event driven architecture, that translation comes in forms of converting say an event to something meaningful of a command within your service boundary. So I have here two different service boundaries where they're exchanging messages via message broker. Let's say they're publishing events. And when any of those events get published and we consume them from another service boundary, we're gonna translate that event into something meaningful within our own service boundary. And that's gonna happen in the anti-corruption layer. As an example, I'm in my ordering context and there's this order refunded event that gets published by another service boundary, by my payment processing boundary. So we don't own that event, but we're consuming it within ordering. When that event occurs, we're consuming it within ordering and we need to translate that into something meaningful within our system that we actually need to do. And in that case, I actually need to cancel the order within ordering if the order has been refunded. So what I'm doing is I'm translating from that event to something meaningful within this boundary, which is my cancel order command. So similar type of thing, I'm just creating that command, sending that to our queue, which will then be processed asynchronously within our boundary. Same type of thing, translation happening as a consumer of an event. An anti-corruption layer is a great way to kind of isolate that logic related translating requests from another service or data that you get from another service, converting a message that you're consuming into something meaningful within your service boundary. Again, this is all about translation and isolating that translation and pushing that logic to the edge. This translation isn't creating records for you or dealing with your data access or any other type of business logic. It's strictly about translation. As with everything, there's trade-offs. We get the benefit of kind of isolating that translation code and we put that to the edge. Some of the downsides here is in my example, I'm adding latency. I'm converting that external order into a place order, adding that to a queue, and then that gets process separately. So that whole latency of placing an order from external system is now longer than if I were just do it all in line. You're adding indirection. Now this is beneficial, but you're still adding indirection. So it's gonna be harder to actually kind of navigate how an order is actually placed from that external system. Another consideration is just how large your any corruption layer may get and how much translation you actually need to do. I say this because this is often used when you're trying to migrate functionality from a legacy system into some type of new service that you're working on. So as you, and depending on how much you're actually trying to migrate in terms of functionality, if you're moving more and more functionality over, but you still need to use the legacy service, as you could suspect, your any corruption layer is gonna be fairly large the more translation that you have to do because you're building more and more into your new service. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.